Hello everyone, today we are going to talk about phytophthalaplite in Chile. Under this topic, we will be looking at some diseases of Chile, introduction to phytophthalaplite, life cycle and its infection, inoculum dispersal, disease symptoms, conditions favoring disease development, and some management strategies. Diseases of Chile Different diseases that reduce the yield of chili occur in every chili producing area. A major disease that limits chili production in Bhutan is Phytophthora blight. Other diseases include Sarcosphora leaf spot, damping off, anthracnose, and powdery mildew. However, for today's presentation, we'll be only looking at Phytophthora blight. Phytophthora blight. It is commonly known as chili wilt. It is caused by Phytophthora capsicae. It belongs to the class Oomycetes, which is also known as water mold. It looks similar to fungi, but it is closely related to brown algae. Host range, it affects all cocoa beds, such as cucumber, watermelon, squash, and pumpkin, and solanaceous crops, such as tomato, eggplants, and pepper. Some bean varieties have also been reported to be affected by the pathogen. It is a devastating disease of chili and occurs worldwide. Phytophthora capsicae is a pathogen of considerable economic and scientific importance because it attacks a wide range of vegetable crops. This not only affects the current season yield and income, but also the options to choose crops. It also has high level of genotypic diversity and sexual recombination in many field conditions. Therefore, having a knowledge on this parasite can help to develop control methods which will also help in providing insight into the management of other oomycetes. Phytophthora capsicae also makes a good pathogen model for scientific studies, especially in regards to sexual reproduction because they are easy to grow, mate and manipulate in the lab. It was first described in 1922 from New Mexico by Leonin. It was first reported in 1995 in Bhutan from Loveza. Life Cycle and Infection It has unique life cycle that routinely employs both sexual and asexual reproduction for propagation and survival. Sexual Reproduction It is a heterothallic species. The isolates have either A1 or A2 mating types. Both mating types are required in close proximity for mating to occur. Sexual spores, which are known as O spores, can live in the soil for years as they are resistant to harsh environmental conditions. Oospores produce mycelium and or sporangia. Asexual reproduction. It produces sporangia which looks like white powder or icing sugar. The majority of life cycle stages require a host as it appears that Phytophthora capsicae can survive in the soil for a certain period of time as oospores. Invasion is followed by growth and colonization, as you have seen in the case of bean anthracnose. The tissue collapse and sporulation occur. Under optimal conditions, the time from infection to sporulation occurs within two to three days. Phytophthora capsicae is a hemibiotrope. The infection features two distinct phases, as in the case of bean anthracnose. It, it has an early phase and a later phase. The early infection phase has a high fold protrusion or hostoria, which pushes the host cell membrane inwards. This helps form direct host pathogen interface. During this phase, cells do not appear to be infected or they are in biotrophy stage which indicates local suppression of defense response of the plant. Later phase. As the disease progresses, the pathogen switches to necrotrophy, killing infected cells, tissues collapse and necrosis occur. Tissue collapse is followed by sporangia emergence, which provides the means for dispersal and a new infection cycle occurs. Figure 1 shows the infection phase of the pathogen. If you look at the images in figure A, from 0 hours to 18 hours, the pathogen is in biotrophic phase. During this phase, the leaf looks fairly fresh and clean. And from 42 hours to 66 hours, it enters into necrotopic phase, whereby the pathogen releases phytotoxins and enzymes that degrade the cells of the host plant. When you look at the image at 42nd hour, the leaf is gradually showing the symptoms with small spots. And by 66th hour, the lesions have become fairly visible and it appears to be water-soaked lesion. 
and by the 90th hour the sporulation occurs and which helps in continuing the cycle of infection similarly the figure 2 also shows the pyotrophy necrotrophy and sporulation phase of the pathogen during the early phase which is indicated by colorless or white cells the spore has landed on the healthy tissue of the plant it is gradually starting to germinate and as it is entering into the necrotrophy phase the spore has already penetrated into the host cell or tissue. At the later stage of the necrotrophy, the spore has already started invading and colonizing the host tissue and by the time the spore relation phase occurs, there is an emergence of the sporangia which helps in the continuation of the infection cycle. Figure 2 shows the disease cycle. Let's start with the primary inoculum. The pathogen remains in the debris of the infected plants. As shown by the image here, if both the mating types, A1 and A2, are present, then oospores are produced. Like already mentioned in the previous slide, oospores can survive for years in soil and will infect roots of fruit when conditions are favorable. The infected plants and fruit produce millions of asexual sporangia. It was found that the surface of a single infected squash fruit contained 3 billion viable spores which means the infection is going to be more severe and economically more damaging. During the rainy period or irrigation events, the sporangia of the pathogen is easily dislodged from the infected surfaces and when they are immersed in the water, the sporangia quickly releases 20 to 40 swimming zoo spores. These zoo spores are negatively geotrophic, therefore they swim upwards towards the plant. Once they come in contact with the plant, they insist and adhere to the plant and produce germ tube, which is followed by penetration and colonization of the host tissue. This eventually results in the collapse of the tissue and the sporulation takes place. Again, as already mentioned in the previous slide, this sporangia helps in the new infection cycle. Inoculum dispersal. Dispersal mode. Water is one of the most important dispersal or dissemination mechanism of the pathogen. It can also be disseminated by the wind, especially to longer distances. Soil. It can cause primary infection because the zoospore survives in the soil for a longer period of time. Also by human activities such as movement during the rainy period or by choosing the sites where water accumulates a lot through seeds and animals. Symptoms vary considerably according to the host, plant part infected and environmental conditions. For example, in dry areas, roots and crowns are infected showing distinctive black to brown, black or brown lesions. In wet areas, all parts of the plant are infected such as roots, crown, foliage and fruit. The root infections causes damping off in seedlings and stunted growth wilting and dead in older plants. Stem and branch infection have dark purplish or brownish lesions. Lesions appear water soles, grayish brown spot on leaves and fruits starting from the tip of the pot and the leaf margin. Infected fruits turn soft and seem to melt away. Figure 3 shows the fruit rod where the lesion appears to be water soaked with olive green to light green color. Figure 4 shows fresh sporangia on the surface of the infected fruits. Figure 5 shows the infected stem, which has brown discoloration, indicating that it is dying. Figure 6 shows the infection spreading upward through the main stem and the branches. Figure 7 shows the collar rod. Figure 8 shows the wilting of the plant. Figure 9 illustrates the infected leaf where the lesion is light green or gray green in color. Figure 10 illustrates infected leaf, which is turning tan or scalded. Figure 11 depicts the infected leaves much more in the later stage where the necrosis has occurred, eventually leading to the collapse of the tissue. Figure 12 and 13 shows the root rod. Conditions favoring disease development. Prolonged rain or irrigation leading to excessive soil moisture condition. When the soil is saturated, it can cause root and crown rot, killing the matured plants. Repeated cultivation of chili and other susceptible host crops in the same field can also create favorable conditions for the pathogen, whereby they do not have to rely on mating in order to survive.
Stubbles of the host left in the feed can also cause favorable conditions for the pathogen. Optimum temperature ranges between 25 to 30 degrees Celsius. Now let's look at the management strategies. Resistance and management. Using resident varieties, if available, would be better. Once established, it is hard to control, therefore preventive measures are better. Most control strategies are aimed at limiting the losses by controlling or limiting free water. Some of the cultural practices that can be adopted are choosing a site where drainage is better, growing the crops on raised beds at least 15 to 20 cm of height, using controlled irrigation such as drip irrigation, practicing crop rotation with non-host using clean seeds and seedlings to avoid early infection, maintaining proper spacing or population density of the crop, which will allow drying of the canopy, and also mulching the beds, which will reduce the infection caused by splashing of the infected soils. However, under warm and wet conditions, no chemical or cultural management were found effective. As a last resort, chemical control can be adopted. First spray of mancozy at 2 gram per liter of water should be done within the first week after transplantation. Second spray of mencozeb at 2 gram per liter of water should be done 30 days after the first spray. Waiting period of at least 7 weeks must be observed after the last spray before harvesting. If second spray proved to be ineffective against the pathogen, then a third spray of copper oxychloride at 2.5 gram per liter of water should be done 14 days after the second spray.